Yes, I will definitely not have any raps, but I could rap the whole talk if you guys would like me to. <laughs> so I uh, grew up in a very small town outside of Kansas City, Missouri. This is actually a Google image street map view of the house that I grew up in. I lived on a nine acre farm. Uh, whoops, sorry, wrong button here. Um, let me start that over. Okay, I'm giving away the, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. So I grew up on a nine acre farm off a gravel, gravel road, really in the middle of nowhere. And the reason I bring this up is because unlike a lot of scientists, I didn't really discover my passion in, for science at an early age. And a lot of this just had to do with the fact that I lived in the middle of nowhere in a very rural area where science just wasn't commonplace. I didn't have any great role models. And really things continued, like, uh, that, continued that way for me for quite some time and really until, it wasn't until my junior year of college when things began to change. And at that point I had a really great opportunity to go do an internship at the Cancer Research Department at Merck. And that really opened my ideas to the world of research and, and maybe discover how much I love science. And from there I decided to go to graduate school at Johns Hopkins and that's when things really changed for me very dramatically. So anyone that's ever been to Hopkins, you know that it's in inner city Baltimore. So I went from living in small farmhouses my whole life to living in, a, this is my actual house, this is a 10 foot wide row house uh, in inner city Baltimore where my neighbors were no longer farmers, uh, but instead there was a bar just to the north of us in a strip club across the street. <laughs> So this was a huge shock for me for, for a small town boy from Missouri, uh, but I ended up absolutely loving it. And at this point was also, I went through sort of a scientific transformation as well. And, and this is a really great lesson I think for especially the MD PhD students in the audience. Uh, and going into grad school with sort of an open mind. And I came in because of my experience at Merck wanting to be a cancer biologist. I loved animal physiology. And when I got there, I immediately heard a talk from my future PhD advisor who talked all about using fission yeast as a model organism to understand cholesterol metabolism. And at this point, I completely changed my viewpoint and fell in love with the concept of using simple model organisms to inform us about complex human diseases. And I've stayed with that mantra now from through my postdoc and into my own lab here at Utah, where now we're using the simplest of model organisms, budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, to unlock questions in the aging process to understand why we age and really why aging is the greatest risk factor for disease. So our motivation behind this is, is really the disease aspect of this work. And as you can see here, these are death statistics taken from the CDC um, and showing across the board, as we age, our chances of getting just about every disease, heart disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, increases dramatically. And so the idea is that there's something that goes on in our bodies, in our cells, in our tissues that changes with age that makes us susceptible for getting all of these diseases. And so researchers in the aging field uh, are, are really going after this and, and because the idea is instead of going after you know, cancer individually or diabetes, is the idea is if we could delay the onset of whatever this aging factor is, that we have the potential to delay the uh, progression of all of these diseases across the board, which would have a profound effect on human health. And so the big question is, what is this? What is this aging factor you know, that we all have that makes us susceptible to these diseases? And there's a mounting, uh, a large amount of evidence that's been mounting over the last 10 to 15 years to suggest that what this is, is really just a gradual slow decline in very fundamental basic cellular biology processes that are conserved across evolution. So this is a diagram of a eukaryotic cell with its many different organelles. And it's become clear, especially in non-dividing cells like neurons in our body, that over time, these organelles succumb to damage. And the cells are actively trying to repair this all the time, but eventually you get to a point, depending on your genetics and environmental factors you're exposed to, where you just can't fight this any longer. And you'll, these cells will eventually die, and this can lead to a different disease, um, any one of these age-associated diseases. And sort of the poster child organelle for this is the mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They generate energy in the form of ATP and are very involved in metabolism. And it's become very clear, probably most of you in this room have heard that changes in mitochondrial function are linked very clearly to a number of different diseases, Parkinson's especially, which I'll talk a little bit about today, diabetes, many different metabolic disorders. So although we have a clear idea that changes in mitochondrial function are a driving force in these diseases, the problem is we can't oftentimes address this because we have no idea how mitochondria became dysfunctional in the first place. And so if we could figure that out and potentially prevent that from happening, that would give us a really great avenue for, for new therapeutics against these aging diseases. And really the, the reason that we can't understand this is because it's extremely difficult to understand age-associated processes because they happen over a very long period of time. So in humans, we're talking 50 to 70 years 
in which our mitochondria are gradually deteriorating. We can't watch this happen. All we can do is see you know, samples from patients that have died from these diseases and see that there's changes in their mitochondrial function. And so the question is, how do we go about studying this? And this is where I come back to the idea and what we're doing in our lab is using model systems. So we're using very specifically the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, the simplest of all eukaryotes, to really ask two questions. So the first of these is what causes mitochondrial dysfunction during the aging process? And secondly, we've been interested in understanding what sort of mechanism cells have to combat this. Um, because we all have mitochondrial dysfunction, but we don't all get these diseases. And it turns out our cells are equipped with a number of different defense mechanisms to prevent this sort of gradual damage accumulation of mitochondria over time. So you may be asking yourself, how in the world does a yeast cell age? And it turns out that it does. And these are fantastic models for understanding aging. So there's a, a large amount of research in the last 10 to 15 years to show that the aging process is evolutionarily conserved. And it turns out that phenotypes that occur during the aging of simple organisms like yeast are similar to those that happen in mammalian cells and in humans, uh, and also genes that we can manipulate to extend longevity. Some of the, the longest lifespan extending genes were actually first identified in yeast, and now they've been shown to be effective all the way up through primates. So there's something fundamentally conserved, and this sort of comes back to the idea that it's very basic cell biology mechanisms that are changing during the aging process. And so by studying aging in, in a model system like yeast, we can make key insights that will ultimately impact human health. And so they, these are aging yeast cells. These are microscopy images of yeast. Uh, and what I'm showing you, this is a, a young yeast cell on the left, and on your right is a very old yeast cell. And aging in yeast is defined as the number of times an individual cell can divide to produce a daughter. And so we always know how old these cells are, and we can purify them from populations because we can stain them uh, by, with a fluorescent dye that stains scars that are left over after every single division of these cells. And so we've been using this system now to try to understand, again, those two questions I, I mentioned a second ago. How do cells lose mitochondrial function with age? And what sort of pathways do they have to protect themselves? And so the great thing for us is we discovered a few years ago that as in humans, uh, aging yeast also exhibit mitochondrial dysfunction. So what I'm showing you here are, are microscopy images of uh, mitochondria. On the left is a healthy mitochondria in a young cell, and we know it's healthy based on its shape. So it's very tubular in nature. Uh, and you can see in the middle panel here, this is an old cell, and I probably don't have to explain it very well to you, but you can tell that this is aggregated and there's little small fragments of mitochondria all over the place. These are very dysfunctional, and this is prevalent across the yeast population. And so what we've done is use a number of genetic screens in yeast to identify genes that could suppress mitochondrial dysfunction with age. So give us what we see on the far right, where we have an old cell with now a very tubular, healthy mitochondria. And so from these genetic screens, we've worked backwards to sort of make two fundamental insights, first in yeast biology, and now we've begun to move these into human systems to impact Parkinson's disease. And the first of these is that it turns out that mitochondrial fun uh, problems in old cells are actually caused by changes in another organelle first, the lysosome. So the lysosome is well known as sort of the garbage pail of the cell where things get degraded, um, but it also has a less well understood function and that's in nutrient storage. And what we discovered and, and published about three years ago is that the function of the lysosome deteriorates first and the inability of faulty lysosomes to store nutrients correctly somehow impacts mitochondrial function with aging. And so this novel sort of metabolic connection between lysosomes and mitochondria has now been shown to be conserved in mammals, and it turns out that mutations in an important lysosomal subunit, the vacuolar ATPase, are now linked to Parkinson's disease. So we think this has good promise to sort of move into human systems at this point. And the second thing that I'll leave you with that we've also uncovered is a quality control pathway or a defense mechanism for cells where they can prevent lysosome-induced mitochondrial dysfunction. And this relies on a key protein called RSP5 in yeast, and NED4 MMA in cells. And again, we've just discovered this pathway, are characterizing it in both yeast and mammals. And we're very excited because a group at MIT in the last couple of years has now shown that chemical activators of NED4 show very good therapeutic promise against Parkinson's disease. So I hope from this I've been able to tell you how we can use a simple model organism like yeast to inform us on sort of basic cell biology processes that are going wrong during the aging process. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge some of the folks who have helped me get to this point. Uh, Peter Esmondshade, my grad advisor who exposed me to model organisms, and Dan Gottschling was my postdoc advisor at the Hutch, and of course my lab here at Utah who's doing all this, this work. Thank you.
question for Adam. Joe. A question about uh, the cell division. So you've got an old mother cell that has many hits in it, and this new daughter cell. And it looks like from your pictures that there's some mechanism in cell division that's preventing the fragmented mitochondria and the, and the fragmented lysosomes from moving into the new daughter cell. So kind of cell division is asymmetry there. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So the question was, he's, he's pointing out the fact that it looks like there's an asymmetric mechanism that can prevent damage from getting into newborn cells. And that's absolutely true. Uh, it has been known for quite some time. So these old cells, when they produce daughters, lifespan is reset. All the phenotypes are reset. And, and what we've actually discovered is I told you earlier that changes in lysosome function are what drive this process. And if we've shown drive lifespan changes in yeast, and actually the vacuole itself is what's reset. So, uh, the, sorry, the lysosome, it's called the vacuole in yeast. So as these cells age, when they produce a newborn daughter cell, there's some sort of mechanism that we don't understand that fully regenerates lysosomal function. And we're very interested in sort of understanding what that is. So my only question is your house got a nice yard or the next to a strip club now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's any strip clubs in Utah, but now we ha we've moved up in the world. We no longer live in a 10-footer, as we oh, call it. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you.